Okay, everyone, let's get started. Um, I'm Katie Dichter. I am a librarian at Central. You might feel a little bit surprised that Kimberly Tate Malone isn't hosting this conversation as she has been doing for years and years and years. Um, she's here and I want to thank her for letting me do COSIs this quarter because I love it so much. Um, and it's a little bit new to me, so we're all in it together. Uh, forgive my, my uh, small errors. Uh, but I feel so thankful that here in week two that you all are here. Um, let's start with a land acknowledgement. On behalf of Seattle Central College, I acknowledge the unceded land on which we stand today as the traditional home of the Coast Salish people. Also the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering and to this dialogue. Land acknowledgement is a traditional custom dating back centuries for many native communities and nations. We thereby express our respect and honor the indigenous peoples of the land on which we work and live. Um, and in a moment, I will put in the chat um, some links for you to support Real Rent Duwamish, sign the Duwamish petition for federal acknowledgement, um, and a little link to find out uh, whose land you're on if you don't happen to be on Duwamish land. I also want to read a labor acknowledgement. Wait, hold on one moment. I'm going to let in another attendee. Kato is coming and I love that. Um, okay, we also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, state and institution are built. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent. We recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor and immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. I'm putting in the chat the links that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'll let one more attendee in. Okay say a few more words about COSI and then I'll introduce our presenters for the day. Again, um, gracious thank you to Kimberly. Um, I do want to say a little bit about the history of COSI for some of y'all who might not know it. Um, the library at Seattle Central started COSI during the Occupy movement. I had to look this up because I couldn't remember it. So Occupy was on Seattle Central's South Lawn. All the folks out there um, camped out for the movement. That was November, 2011. That's when a librarian at Central named Kelly McHenry, which many of you will remember, um, and the whole Seattle Central community, the whole Seattle Colleges community, there, was, there were a lot of conversations surfaced during that movement and we brought them into the library and started um, weekly conversations on social issues. Kimberly Tate Malone started at our library in 2013 um, and worked in partnership with Kelly uh, from that point on and eventually took over uh, hosting and um, administering COSIs when Kelly McHenry retired. And until um, the pandemic, COSIs happened every week, every Thursday at noon um, in good old classroom A which we will continue again at some point, we'll be face to face again. Um, and COSI, you know, as a continuation of that moment in our history, in recognizing that we need to talk about important things that impact our community, um, that's what we seek to do. So a free and open exchange of ideas, that's what libraries are about. Um, generating conversations, conversations that we won't all agree on, but that we welcome different points of view, um, with honor and respect. Um, yeah, at the end of the discussion, I'll put a link in the chat for some feedback um, and just so that we can know who is showing up. And I'll also say quickly that our next COSI is May 5th to celebrate Asian Pacific Heritage Month. Um, I'm super, super excited for guests 
inside and outside the college to talk about Asian American labor activism in Seattle. And um, in addition to celebrating Asian Pacific Heritage Month, it's just a really, really awesome time to be watching what's happening with labor and labor activism all over the world. So join us for that May 5th. Okay, so today, today we have Make It Make Sense. We have student leaders. I'm always honored to have students in the space leading these conversations. Today we'll talk about textbook affordability. We are joined by three members of Seattle Central's Associated Student Council. We have Echo Ablakim, the executive of Student Success, Wendy Bu, the executive of Finance, and Mary Wynn, executive of Legislative Affairs. I'll turn it over to you all. I'll go first, I guess. Uh, sorry, Mary. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, guys. My name is Echo uh, Abikin. I'm from China. This is my uh, seventh quarter at Seattle Central uh, College. And uh, my position is Executive of Student Success, uh, promoting OER and promoting for a textbook fund is one of my main privileges. And I'm super happy to be here. And I'm happy to see your faces here. Thank you, guys for coming and I'll give it to Wendy. Thank you, Echo. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Wendy. Um, I'm the executive finance with ESG and um, I'm a second year student here at Seattle Central. We transferred out next quarter. Um, and today I'll be briefly talking about um, the OER from the um, finance, the funding, the f &A perspective. And I'll pass it to Mary. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mary. I am the executive of Legislative Affairs. Today I'll kind of be talking about what um, student leaderships, uh, student leaders, excuse me, have been doing in terms of um, advocacy for textbook affordability and how it um, relates to um, legislative priorities on a state level. Uh, back to you, Echo. So do I get to start it off? Okay, so. Um, before I start, I just want to uh, thank you again for coming. And I might not be speaking in advanced English, so please forgive me that and forgive my little mistakes out of uh, nervous. <laughs> thank you. I'll be sharing my screen. Just give me a second. Okay, here we have it. OER looks just fine. Okay. Okay, so the first slide I have is before we go into uh, OER, I wanted to um, just uh, give a brief idea about like how expensive the textbooks are. I'm pretty sure you all know it, but let's just have another quick update on that. So here is a survey I did this year. It's only from ASC, only seven people from a small range. So the first question was, uh, what is the, the most amount of money that you spend on textbook and software? There were um, plenty of answers. It was like 300 and 300 and 120 and uh, which program there are, there are questions about which program bio biochemistry political science running start i think the running start one was the the one who spent like 300 and i know who that is the executive of issues and concern she's also a high school student and um let's see what we have i think there was the question about mm, oh there we there we have it so this one is asking um surprising oh, okay yeah this is, this is the correct one so uh it's asking 
it's asking uh, students to uh, maybe share a story about like how they're how how they're like facing the difficulty with textbook pricing. So we got an answer here. It says, "I'm doing two schools at twice at, at once, and surprisingly, the expense I must pay for everything besides tuition is a little bit higher than the other school I am." And paying the textbook on top of tuition has been challenging. Oftentimes, these textbooks are hard to get. If I'm do, if I'm looking, I'll buy them second hand. I'll buy them second hand. Yeah, it's, let's see. We have other. Oh, God. So what's next? I don't. I just have. Okay. So I have an I have an um, quick update from the textbook we purchased um, in fall 2022. It, it was purchased by the textbook fund, which I am also handling. So this is the one. Um, we had uh, 1,500 in ASC textbook for 2022, but it was completely used uh, in fall only, and this is the receipts for it. After counting them, I noticed that we Okay, we were able to buy only 18 textbooks with 1500 and we had to turn down students in winter because we had no money for them to for to help them to help uh, buy textbooks and stuff so this is just a brief idea about how expensive the textbooks are so this one costs 168 this one is 147 this one is even 300 240 198 and 250, and they're pretty expensive. Just wanted to give an update on that. And let's go back to, yeah, like I said, the 1500 of ASC textbook fund was completely used in fall quarter. So it was, it was difficult to help other students in uh, winter when they needed help. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, when do you want to take, take it to your floor? Sure. Um, so um, for those who might know or might not already know, I'm just gonna give like a little background information uh, about the textbook fund we um, have on this slide. So the book fund is uh, funded by the SNA um, budget, SNA fund and um the, thank you Angel. and the sna budget is actually collected from the students um each year that's included in their tuition and um there are around like 20 programs supported by this fund besides the um, book fund and um here we have some data um from the that's collect from the reports we have for the past two years so for last academic year we have allocated um, 7,200 to the textbook fund. And then for the current exam year, we have allocated 1,500 for the entire year. You can see there's a large decrease of the um, fund we gave to the textbook fund here. So the reason behind that is that there's actually a lower enrollment trends cost um, to the decrease of the total um, SNA fund we have. So um, as we're doing the allocation recommendations, we consider not only the book fund, but also all the other programs supported by the fund, uh, which included programs such as the writing center, um, the tutorings and uh, the info central, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really difficult to um, allow us to have the ability to give more funds for the textbook fund because we have to consider um, the fund as a whole uh, and then you know just to make sure each program can still operate um, properly and um, for this year we actually got lucky because uh, we found some more funds from the um, ASC budget um, so we move some of the budget to the textbook fund. So for the current year, it's actually $3,000 um, to use for buying textbooks for the students to use. And for the next year, we've already made our decisions and we 
try our best to increase more funds to um, the textbook fund. So the result is 3,100 for the next exam year. But that's still a very limited amount of money um, to support the students because like for $1,500 of dollars, it could buy like around 17, 18 textbooks in total. And then maybe support like around 10 to 20 students in total and how many students we have at our college a lot more than that right so it's definitely not enough uh, to support the students for their needs for the textbooks and um, another thing I want to mention is that some of the students actually drop their classes and then stop enroll uh, at the Seattle Central College and that actually caused and decrease in the total budget we have to use to support them. So there's actually a negative cycle going on uh, if the textbook just, if they cannot pay for the textbook, they cannot afford for the textbook. So um, what I wanna say is that if we can try our best to use the OER that can reduce the cost of textbooks. It can not only like benefit students from the academic, it can not only um, have more resources to support them to continue the education, but also from um, the SNA uh, committee, the SNA perspective, um, I think that we can say, if we can save more funds um, for the other programs we are supporting, if we can use you know, the textbook fund we're using now to give it those two other programs such as the writing center or like the source, we can actually um, hire more students for the tutorings or like holding more events for the school and also benefit the students just like improve their whole college experience at the Seattle Central College to like give them better experience in the whole, not only the education side, you know? So that's all I have. Back to you, Echo. Thank you, Wendy. And like Wendy said, um, 1500 is is actually not too much for students to buy textbooks. And um, like I said in earlier, we, could, we were turning down students from a quarter because we had no money. And uh, me and Dennis, we, we found some unallocated um, funds from the ASC budget. So we we asked to move some some money to the current textbook fund and we got actually 2000. And uh, just a few days ago, I received an email from Dennis saying that another 1500 was used from the 2000 we, we currently have. And we might need to make another motion to have another 1500. Uh, uh, another fifteen hundred uh, dollars to be uh, allocated from the ASC budget again. So that's that shows the high demand in um, students and the textbooks. And let's go to the next slide. This is just a quick survey. I just want to ask the ask if you have heard of OER and if you know what it is about and what is like it, how it works and how it is processed for teachers if you have please click yes in the reactions button if no um, just click no in the reaction button thank you so we have one two three four five six seven eight Nine, ten, eleven. It seems like Caroline and Carlos and Kimberly have not heard about it. I think maybe they just can't find their green check marks because I know um, Carlos has Carlos hosted the OER session at the district level. Oh, um, that was very recently. Oh, and I see Yvonne had put in the chat, yes, and now is doing the green check. And oh, Kimberly found her check well. So all the librarians, you can you can guarantee they've heard of OER. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Caroline uh, clicked no. I thought I clicked no. I did yeah. click no. Um, I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. And so that's one of the reasons I'm here is I wanted to learn more about the subject. 
Perfect. Thank you so much for coming and you will sure know how it works. And let's go to the next slide. Um, so we have like a brief explanation here. If Dave can help me with it. Yeah, I'll pop <clears throat> I'll pop in. Thanks, Echo. Um yeah, there's a lot of text on this slide, so don't worry too much about it. I just wanted to read this first um definition of OER because I think it kind of gets at the heart of it and the variety of OER. Um, so OER are teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain. So they're freely accessible to anyone or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their use free, uh, sorry, their free use or repurposing by others. So they freely used, freely changed and updated by uh, anyone. Open education resources include full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software, and any other tools, materials or techniques used to support access to knowledge. So I like that last sentence because it kind of um, gets us out of thinking of OER just as textbooks. It's all sorts of things. It's textbooks that come with uh, quizzes and tests and, and other educational support material. So back to you, Echo. Thank you so much, Dave. <laughs> uh, what am I doing? Okay, let's go to the next slide. And what benefits us by choosing OER? From a student perspective, every textbook from OER is free, saves students money to buy their favorites. Like, like me, I personally, I like to spend my money on clothing and stuff. And Wendy likes to spend her money on food. And yeah, for a college student, it is uh, important to allocate their budget because uh, we don't uh, earn as much, even though we have like a part-time job. And especially for international students, I am international and I pay nearly 4,000 a quarter. And I also pay rent because I don't have my family with me, and that's a lot of money. And I just, I just feel fit, like face challenge allocating money to maybe squeeze out like 300 to 400 to buy textbooks. And for a second reason is digital copy. It it doesn't have to be carried around with, um, with heavy weight. Because I remember when I when I, I went to high school in America, and we only get to use the the hard copy ones and they were like really thick and then we had to carry them around and my neck would really hurt every day so that's another benefit and let's go to the next slide so we have a video that was edited and uh, surveyed by the library i believe katie knows about it and i'll, I'll be playing that katie do you want to stop uh, recording the screen so yeah thanks for reminding me echo uh -huh. share my screen again. So after seeing the video, I believe <laughs> we all see how creative our students are. <laughs> and uh, I see a few of those points is about like hard to carry. They want, they don't want it to be like really heavy because you only use it for three months, a quarter and, and buying a textbook for 200 even 300 dollars and you only use it for three months that is actually not a reasonable pricing and um that's what i think personally and in this slide we have um surveys saying that a lot of students that escaped uh, their class due to the high pricing range of the textbooks i personally uh, did once uh, last court last winter quarter i I was taking an accounting class and then I had like a textbook budget for $200 and I already spent them for other two of my classes. And I had, and I found out that for my, for that accounting class, it was accounting 203, which is the last accounting class I had to take. So um, when I found out that we had to buy, uh, buy like a digital uh, website account for that class, and I found out it was uh, literally $200. So I asked Wendy, she had she had taken that class as well, but she said she taken she she took that class from uh, accounting 201, 202, and 203. So she she was able to use uh, the the account for three quarters, but I only needed to take uh, 203. 
So it was not a, a reasonable price for me to spend 200, extra 200 on that. So I skipped that class and I'm taking accounting 203 this quarter with another professor. Yeah, and uh, this is um, this survey was uh, so, uh, collided by Dave. It was a it was a big survey that was taken in 2018, and uh, it was from the all the Washington State uh, uh, Community College and Technical Colleges. And there were 38 percent of respondents didn't register for a class because they could not afford the required materials. And next slide. I will give it to Mary. Floor is yours, Mary. All right, thank you. So um, as previously mentioned, student leaders have been actively advocating for textbook affordability on a state level um, over the course of the last couple months. Um, being the executive of legislative affairs, I have been uh, given the opportunity to meet with representatives and really advocate for you know student needs. Um, of course, uh, textbook affordability is a big issue for us right now. Um, specifically, we've spoken to Frank Chop, um, and we we spoke about um, how there are bills that have been claimed to be passed to address textbook affordability, but college faculties have not heard um, anything about it. I also brought this up with Senator Jamie Peterson, um, and there seems to be a lot of confusion and miscommunication in terms of what actually has been passed and what has not. Um, and uh, ultimately, I think that um, students are kind of bearing the burden of um, just kind of hoping um, things are going to get more affordable or seeing like some sort of structural change. Uh, in the meanwhile, all we can do as students is, you know, pay for our textbooks, continue going to class. Um, and it just seems to be um, a really like difficult situation, of course. Um, and legislative sessions kind of can take quite a while as well. Um, so OER is a great sort of um, resource that allows students to have the same access to textbooks without compromising the quality of learning, right? Because ultimately, we're all on the same side, students and teachers. I don't think that teachers go out of their way to make textbooks expensive or choose expensive textbooks um, so that students' lives are difficult. I, I, I do not believe that at all. I think that you guys have a method of learning that you guys think is efficient and um, like a quality of learning that shouldn't be compromised. And I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, we would not want to invest, you know, our money into textbooks that were made 20 plus years ago. Um, in my polit political science class last quarter, we did a lot of analyzation of um, Donald Trump's presidency. And I think that's a lot of relevancy that pertains to my lived experiences and not something that's happened before I was born. So the fact that we have textbooks and resources that are up to date with the current events that are happening, I think is also really important. We should be able to have access to that information that's that's you know relevant to this day and age. But um, I think that if we can find some sort of common ground where you know um, it is easy for for teachers and instructors to to find quality you know resources in textbooks uh, while students have access to those same textbooks then um, that that'd be great um, and I would um, you know like like I said um, previously mentioned it's not like an attack or making some aspect um, of this to to feel like they have to change because we're blaming you and you're pointing fingers at us. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's just finding like a, some sort of common ground because ultimately textbooks are a huge part of our education and at the expense of maybe paying for a textbook over a meal or other really important priorities in your life. I think that it's a hard decision to make for students and oftentimes we are put in those predicaments. Um, so yes, um, back to you Echo, thank you for the floor. Thank you so much, Mary, that was wonderful. At last, we have come to the discussion slide. So I'll ask the first question for our faculty. What are the barriers to, to choosing different textbooks or course material? Go for it, Nicole. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I, I'm throwing stuff into the chat. Um, I remember going to college and 
you know, I, I had to pay for a lot of it myself. I had some VA benefits. My parents helped me pay for some, but I mean, it was, I worked full time for several semesters and I remember the pain of going in and, and, and to the bookstore. It's like, you want what for books? And it was just ridiculous. And so I actively try to minimize the cost to my students. And, and right now I'm running four of my classes OER, uh, which is challenging. You have to find alternate reading material that kind of replaces what would have been in the book. Um, and I'm able to do that for some classes. Um, I teach application development and IT. So it's technical. You know, there's both good and bad to that. The, the good is there's tons of resources in YouTube, Wikipedia, um, the operating system sites, places like that, that I can go to and get information that is pertinent and on point for free. The kind of bad side is technical tends to be, uh, if you're not into it already, a challenge that creates a barrier to entry. And so the thing the textbook has that's more difficult to find free is moving slowly and says, here's how you do that step. Here, here's the example, um, uh, you know, do this first, then this. Whereas if I go online, it's sort of everybody kind of expects you to be at later level three or four. And if you're level one, that becomes quite challenging. So for example, my database classes, I, I have to use books for because I can't find really good free resources, open source resources, or just free resources that can um, allow me to uh, give the students a, or I, here's how you log on. And here's an example. Here's how you create a database. Here's an example. And, and kind of build up for students that don't have any experience. Uh, another source that I've gone to that I really like is where the school or the instructor pays for the service and then it's free to all the students. Um, I teach my network classes in Cisco Netacad, which is a canvas supported by Cisco. The school pays I think we pay $300 a year or something like that. It's a, it's a really very reasonable price um, to be a academy. It might be more than that, but I mean, it's not like $10,000. It, it's a reasonable price. And once we are a Cisco networking academy, I can then offer all of the resources online, all the reading, all the quizzes, the final exam, all of that's online to my students because we're a member of the academy. So there's a couple of different approaches and that, that actually solves the um, technical barriers to entry problem. That's pretty much all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that, Nicole. Um, I stopped sharing screen echo, I hope that's okay. And I hope I didn't jar anyone electronically. Um, so we have about four minutes. I would love to hear from other faculty the response to the question, what are the barriers for choosing different textbooks or course materials? And I did notice that Kimberly um, just below that in the chat said time. It takes a lot of time to find materials to replace current textbooks. That is true. And yesterday I gave a very, very exaggerated time estimate from research around OER that it takes faculty 600 hours to convert. And then Dave Ellenwood corrected me with the right number, which is on average 70 hours to convert a course from a textbook to open, open materials. So that's, you know, really just what Nicole was describing, which is like finding things at a quality that, um, that replace, the, replace the stuff in the textbook. Any other faculty want to weigh in on that? Um, I was going to say, I uh, definitely the time, right? And um, I think um, 
thinking about what would help is further collaboration among faculty. And I, I think Carlos put in the chat the link to curriculum grants. So faculty can get together. So if you're in a department, you want to create a, um, an OER for biochemistry or for whatever, you can apply for this grant. So we do have those funds to have fa uh, faculty apply. And, and um, I, I did one with a fellow colleague and it was really great. It was really helpful because it was taking time, but it was also time that was compensated and that we could take um, to, to just develop. And it, I think we did it in a couple, no, it actually took us a year to do it. And um, so, but it was two of us, it wasn't just one person. Um, so that's, and, and, and you know, if you're in dip, I know we don't, it'll be, um, I think people sort of get a little scared about OERs, oh, yes, I have to create everything from scratch, but there's so much out there that it is valuable. It's just a matter of how to make it, put it together in a way that makes sense for your class, right? Um, but there's tons of stuff out there, but yeah, putting it together on the time, but there is, there are funds and I hear the library has funds as well. Thanks, Kato. Uh, Dave Ellenwood is stacked and maybe Dave Ellenwood will tell us about those funds from the library. Uh, I will also yeah. say, um, there's, I'll hang out longer if people wanna continue discussing. And of course, if you have to drop off, do so. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on what Kato was saying. Um, I'm so happy to hear about the um, development uh, curriculum development grants. That was really helpful. The library also offers grants. I wanted to talk a little bit about those um, really specifically tailored to um, to OER conversions for classes like Nicole was talking about. Um, so that to, to do the grants, all you have to do is complete a short course. Um, which you can do on Canvas, or you can get together with a librarian to kind of walk you through our curriculum around OER. And um, essentially what we do is uh, support you through a, a grant process where you kind of tell us what you want to do. And then you team up with a librarian to, um, to complete the project. So we've done tons of these so far. We've had really small um, curricular uh, creating, um, sort of course material projects, really small stuff to really large um, conversion grants where we've had uh, a whole class like Psych 100, for example, uh, the, the psych faculty convert the entire class so that the recommended text is uh, an OER option. So we are open to all of those kinds of things. Um, am I forgetting anything, colleagues? I know that, um, Carlos is on stack as well. So I will hand it off to y'all. Thanks, Dave. Um, I just started typing in the chat because I also have to go soon. But what I was just saying is um, I kind of started with the curriculum development grant at the district office. And even though it's limited, um, you know, it, it again, it's not the best alternative for faculty, but it is, it is uh, helpful to to get some compensation for producing materials. And if you look at the website, uh, you know, it's not just not just all for I, uh, OER, but like for hybrid or for online or for all kinds of uh, teaching materials that hopefully and uh, eventually would make it for, uh, you know, more affordable, you know, um, materials. But what I wanted to say is that, uh, just while Carolina mentioned collaboration, um, I think that also a lot of the responsibility gets put on faculty. And I think that unit administrators need to step up a little bit more. Uh, deans, uh, by BPIs, uh, it's not just about the faculty members, it's about the leadership, right? And so we as faculty and students are starting to have the conversation about it, like we know about it, but maybe some upper administration doesn't. And we need to talk about that with them in our division meetings. And then two, uh, at the district level, we get tons of materials, right? Submitted by uh, faculty from North, Central and South, but they get submitted, they get approved, they get reviewed, and then they stay somewhere, right? So we don't promote those. So I think that we need to find a way in the district level to promote those materials, to have either on Canvas or some kind of library where 
if you're teaching chemistry 101 or whatever course that we already have materials for, we can recycle those and promote them because technically everything faculty produces for us belongs to us, right? It's, it's part of the district. So we can recycle our own materials that way. And there's tons of materials. I know ESL, for example, keeps doing a lot of work. They do the work and then the work just stays with that faculty group. Like it should be going to the whole division. It should be going to the whole district, not just to that group. So finding ways to make it sustainable. And that's something that I'm uh, trying to work on. Uh, as faculty development at the district level. So just kind of wanted to, to mention that because I think it's important and, and our students need it and faculty need it. So uh, let's find a way to, to do this. Yeah, thank you so much, Carlos. Um, a thing that I'm thinking about is, as I hear you and see Dennis's point in the chat that um, there's kind of a road trip involved with this, which is like getting the messaging out to different different people. Um, and that makes me think about our kind of carousel of administrators that we see. Um, Bradley Lane, who was our vice president for instruction before the current interim vice president for instruction, knew all about OER because we trained him up and he was an advocate. Well, now he's gone. Uh, the president at the time is gone. So it's this kind of continuous process that we all have to remember, like the faculty. <laughs> we are still here. We know about this stuff, but we have to keep reminding our deans and the you know vice presidents, et cetera. Yeah, the carousel, Dave, because they go somewhere else. It's just not here. OK. OK, it seems like a great time to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Echo. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Mary who had to go to class, I bet, or somewhere else, um, for leading this conversation. So important, so valuable to hear your perspective. Thank you, everyone who joined. Um, yeah, I think what I'm leaving with is we have work to do, and it's exciting. People are into this idea. People know textbooks are kind of a racket. We all know that. So we can make, we can make the world of textbooks and textbook affordability better. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. I will click the red button now. Um, ah, please fill out the form for COSI and we'll see you May 5th at our Asian American History COSI. Thank you. Thank you all so much, Echo, Wendy, Mary. Y'all be great. Thank you. Thank this you. was great. And I love the idea of the road trip. Have fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Keep me excited. Yes. <laughs>